coming tonight. Um, this is a competing night with the Democratic debates, and so um, we knew that it would probably affect our attendance, but nevertheless, the topic that um, we are going to touch on tonight is a very important one. My name is Wes Zonker. I'm the uh, chair of the Greene County Democratic Party, but I think I know all of you, so you should know me. Um, I uh, would like to remind you that we do town hall meetings once a month. It is always the fourth Wednesday of the month, and they are issue-based. Um, trying to educate uh, the public on some of the issues that are important um, to us. And tonight, we're going to take a historical look um, at the impeachment process. And we have um, several um, guests with us tonight in our panel, and I'm going to introduce Fred Hall, and then I'm going to allow him to introduce our other two panelists. Fred um, started practicing law in 1959. He practiced law for... 58 years, and during his time as an attorney, he um, served as president of the Springfield Metropolitan Bar, and then in 2013, he was also named one of the best lawyers in America. So we are very fortunate to have Fred with us tonight, and I'm going to let him introduce the other panelists. Fred? Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to use a microphone? It'll help with the video. Okay, it will help with the video. <laughs> um, we have with us tonight three lawyers to present the issues about impeachment, to try to answer your questions, how it works, uh, whether it's been successful, and, and we can even tell you the uh, 10 presidents that have been attempted to be impeached. And uh, I'll tell you ahead of time, it's never been successful. Okay, uh, on my left is Bob Swear. Bob is a, a longtime a practicing attorney here in Springfield. He has his office up on National. And uh, Bob is, I believe, a general practitioner. That's correct. And uh, Bob has uh, been on this program two or three times, so he knows the routine pretty well. And the other gentleman, is uh, sort of a uh, newcomer to you, this group, Douglas Kays. He's originally from Kansas City, and his idol is a friend of ours, Harry Truman. Uh, Doug uh, went to law school at Kansas City and then came down to Springfield, and uh, he worked trying to organize a little group called the uh, uh, Legal Aid Society in Springfield. And uh, he, had a, he had a closet to work out of, I think it was, in the Woodruff building. <laughs> but seriously, he worked many years uh, trying to grow that little organization. And finally, he was able to talk to two organizations to the east of us, uh, Rolla and uh, Charleston, uh, where our friend Warren Hearns is located. And he got them to join with him into one organization. And he was, for many years, the president of the uh, uh, legal aid of South, Southern Missouri. And uh, that, was, that was quite an achievement. And they all profited uh, from doing so. Well, tonight we wanted to talk to you about imp imp impeachment. You know, what it is, how it works. And we gave you a little handout there, uh, which says uh, the power to impeach. And the first thing is, who has the power to do this? And that is the House of Representatives. To give you a little background on how that happens, the Constitution as that we have today was not written uh, by happenstance. It was very, very deliberate because they had been through the Articles of the Confo uh, Confederation, putting together a nation under an agreement called the Confederation. And uh, it was a total disaster. Didn't work very well. Couldn't raise money. Couldn't raise troops. And it just was not working well. They did all of this while the war was going on. And you have to re realize also, as you look at this, and look at the House and its 
position in the Constitution as number one, there was really a revolution going on within the colonists themselves. Not just the colonists and England, but among the colonists themselves. In other words, there was a class of people in the colonies that were sort of the underdogs and they didn't like being underdogs and they wanted improvement. For instance, only white males could vote. They said that out of the population in Philadelphia, 5% could vote. So you had, in putting this con uh, constitution together, you had these, this competition, not only that, but also worrying about the powers over in Europe that might attack them and try to take them over. So it was, it was a mixed bag. But they finally did to get the Constitution put together. And you will note that in Article I, the power to uh, do, a, do an impeachment is solely up to the House. They do it. And then if they put it together and all vote or not all vote, but simply a majority vote uh, to impeach. It goes over to this to the Senate, and then you got to have a two-thirds majority to convict. And one thing we want you to remember is we're not talking about a legal case here. This is a political act, and impeachment is a political <coughs> act. Okay, would you want to start? Uh, uh, asking me any questions if you've had time to read the read the outline that I gave uh, and the number of uh, presidents that have faced impeachment uh, are, do you want to go straight to uh, feasibility and advisability of having impeachment or would you like to answer question? I just have one question yes ma'am the requirement to convict it said they shall be on oath just what oath are they going to now, I didn't understand your question. In section 3, the requirement to convict, it says when the Senate tries the impeachment, they shall be on oath. I need to know what the oath they are under or on will be. It means uh, that they'll be under oath to tell the truth, to uh, uh, conduct themselves honestly, uh, no lying. No, just beyond their oath. I think that, Bob, what would you say? You have I don't have a clue. I've, I was wondering that myself. How, about, how about you, Doug? I, I don't know, unless it means more like an oath. Um, is this on? Uh, is this on? Uh, may have to sw switch it. I know that when you try a case to a jury, the okay, jury before it. they uh, right. before they before they take their evidence. Uh, you try a case to a jury. The jury is sworn. Yeah. Uh, to uh, and the oath that they take is to follow the the laws and given to them by the court, and to uh, uh, fair and justly and fairly try the facts, considering the evidence. And I assume. I, I guess I always kind of assume that it's the same kind of an oath. I was going to say the same thing, um, except since this is a political act, uh, you know, they're not going to follow uh, what we would normally think uh, as the perfect uh, act that people do in a jury trial. You know, once you get in into a jury trial, the jurors, lawyers, everybody uh, realizes the importance of it and really, I think, generally speaking, try to follow the oath. In the Senate, I've got my doubts about that. <laughs> well, in, in the, uh, you also have to understand that uh, people have asked, what is the standard of, uh, of, uh, of the evidence that is presented that will require conviction? And as you know, in a civil case, it's the preponderance of the evidence, whichever side has the preponderance of the evidence. In a criminal case, as I'm sure you've heard over TV many times, it's 
beyond a reasonable doubt. You are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he did or he didn't do the act. But here, there is no standard. It's, uh, Gerald Ford was quoted as saying, it's whatever the members of the House of Representatives think it ought to be. It's really because it's a political act, you see. Now, uh, I think they were saying on oath, and probably my guess is before they started a, uh, an impeachment proceeding in the Senate, the clerk would probably ask all members to raise your right hand and do you swear to tell the truth and conduct yourself on oath as uh, in this proceeding or something of that nature. That's probably what they'll do. Yes, ma'am. Typically it was, yes. Typically it was. You know, I see it says the Chief Justice is the presiding officer at the Hills Committee. Of the Senate, yes, sir. And in a court case, it's, I don't think, too uncommon for the judge to give instructions to the jury as the trial moves along. Yeah, I don't, there's none of that. You wouldn't expect the, uh, the uh, Chief Justice give instructions to the Senate. Yeah, I don't believe that he would. Okay. He might he might have some statements that he might make, but the senators are going to make their judgment on their own uh, would be my my thought. Uh, and uh, if we'll go through any more questions and then uh, we'll uh, have the first of our uh, 10 presidents uh, Doug has said that he would take those, and especially the one on Andrew Johnson. It was really bitter. Ooh, that was the poor guy that was the vice president after Abraham Lincoln. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Johnson was, uh, would you believe it, he was a Democrat. Even though Lincoln was a Republican, but they were on the union ticket. And, and got elected together. And uh, uh, poor Andrew was trying to be a nice guy. He was trying to carry out the policies of his predecessor, Abraham Lincoln. He was trying to heal the wounds of the South and uh, bring the Union back together again. But the Republicans in the Senate and the House, they wanted no part of it <laughs> and it was bitter bitter so Doug with that uh, why don't you take it take it away well before I do that I, I was gonna respond a little more to what you said you, you know on the the impeachment itself uh, is like a petition like you would in court and there should be allegations uh, and they should follow the confines of that <laughs> Um, now, you know, since this is a political act that isn't always carried out like you would in a courtroom, but, but that's kind of like, that was kind of your question. It, it's sort of like there's no instructions to the jury, so to speak, but, but there is a petition that's laid out the, the allegations that should be followed. You want to add anything, Bob, to that? Okay. Joe, All right. say something else? Uh, I was just going to say that. I think that was my question. Wouldn't the Chief Justice say, no, you know, you all really shouldn't consider this because it's not in the... the uh, that's, they do that. that they do that. And throughout history, that hasn't happened. They've just gone off on anything they wanted to, basically. Um, you know, a lot of people ask about the Supreme Court being involved. And you have to understand, as we say, this is a political process. Now, therefore, uh, uh, the Supreme Court plays no part except for the Chief Justice. Uh, I mean, the court doesn't decide a thing on this. Now, someday, the Supreme Court may, if a case is filed with the Supreme Court, they may decide to hear it. And we may have Marbury versus Madison all over again. <laughs> and they may decide to take jurisdiction. But uh, so far, uh, they have no role to play. Well, uh, let's take this chronologically, and let's go with, with the first one, and that, that is John Tyler. 
And if you will remember from your uh, history classes in, in school, um, the, uh, the election of Tippy Canoe and Tyler II, well, Tippy Canoe was uh, William Henry Harrison. Uh, he was in his late 60s. Uh, his inaugural address was over an hour in the rain and he didn't wear a coat and he was dead in 30 days. His presidency was 30 days long. And so Tyler became the, the president as vice president. Well, back in those days, uh, they'd never had a president die before. And so um, the attitude towards what the vice president is is different than what we have now. They even had people who believed that the vice president didn't have authority to do certain things that a president would. And so, um, uh, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was known as the, uh, his accidency <laughs> uh, and, uh, because he was accidentally president. And so um, he was uh, elected as a Whig and if you remember, the Whigs were uh, kind of a coalition of different groups. Uh, they didn't even have a platform, uh, but they wanted a Southerner on the ticket with William Henry Harrison. So they picked, they picked John Tyler. Well, Tyler really didn't believe in the Whig, the things that most Whigs believed in. And so after he became president, he was constantly in fighting with the, with the Whigs. Uh, he later was ejected from the Whig Party, even though he was the, the president under the, under the Whigs. Um, and one of the things that they were interested in was banking. They wanted a national bank, and he kept vetoing uh, their banking bills. Well, they finally got tired of that, and they decided to impeach him because he kept vetoing their legislation. Um, and so nowadays, you know, we think if you've done something really wrong or really bad, well, this shows you what a political thing impeachment is. Um, uh, and so they, they filed an impeachment, and the, the funny part of it is the next election, uh, they lost the House of Representatives, and so the, it just died right there. But that was the first attempt to impeach um, a president. So it went nowhere. It went nowhere, really. So, um, he was impeached by the House, was not tried in the Senate because the House turned over and ceased to nullify, more or less, right. the prosecution. Right, right. Because you know, keep in mind, the House is the prosecutor and the Senate is the, the jury, so to speak. So, uh, and, uh, and we might make that point. <clears throat> it, it's not anywhere laid out in the Constitution. What happens is, is the, the Speaker of the House appoints a group and they're called the managers and they manage the case over in the Senate. They sort of like, uh, operate like a group of attorneys representing the House to bring this charge. All right, let's see. And then the next one was uh, uh, what Fred was talking about is Andrew Johnson. Well, of course, Andrew Johnson was the vice president for President Lincoln. He wanted to continue President Lincoln's policy of not um, completely destroying the South, of being lenient to the South after the Civil War. Uh, and there were the, the radical Republicans in Congress wanted to really uh, punish. He wanted to rub their nose. <laughs> really wanted to punish the, the, uh, the South. And so um, th that's where the controversy came in and uh, um, the, uh, in they, they did file an impeachment uh, against uh, Pre uh, President Johnson. And uh, uh, the interesting part is, uh, of course, our wonderful President John Kennedy wrote a wonderful book called Profiles in Courage. And uh, one of the people uh, for this impeachment was one of his Profiles in Courage. Um, but what happened was the, uh, the two-thirds needed in the Senate uh, by the radical Republicans was, you know, they just were barely going to make it. Well, seven Republicans felt like this was going too far. It was interfering with the, with the authority of the, of the executive branch. And seven Republicans um, voted uh, not, not to convict. Uh, and so, at the very last, there's, there's only one vote left, and uh, that's what the Profiles in Courage was. The uh, uh, one Republican uh, uh, voted, the last Republican voted not to convict. And so by one vote, uh, President Andrew Johnson was not convicted. Was that John McCain? Yeah, John McCain. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And so we had uh, had John McCain's before. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Fortunately. And this all happened in, in 1866, you know, after the Civil War. Uh, and and uh, 1867 was was the the trial itself, um, and during this time, one of the things that came up was the uh, Congress decided to um, limit the br executive branch by passing a law that said any appointment, any presidential appointment that required a Senate confirmation, that this president could not fire that person without the approval of the Senate. Well, of course, we don't have that now, <laughs> for darn sure. Uh, but that was a law for a while, and they, what they were trying to do was re rein in um, Andrew, Andrew Johnson at the time. And there's a funny story about he tried to get rid of uh, his Secretary of War, uh, uh, who, who was named Stanton, and uh, he, he was a, a carryover from the Lincoln administration. Uh, and he thought, uh, President Johnson thought that Stanton was helping the radical Republicans, and so he tried to fire him. Well, then the radical Republicans said, well, you can't fire him without our consent because we've got this law. Well, uh, you know, one thing led to another. Uh, President Johnson actually appointed Ulysses S. Grant, which is a pretty formidable person, to be the new Secretary of War, and um, Stanton actually barricaded himself in his office and wouldn't leave. And so uh, it's, just, it's just a funny story. And. Uh, uh, it, 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 anyway, eventually, and eventually, it all it all got resolved, and um, uh, um, and Stanton Stanton after after the convict after President Johnson wasn't convicted, uh, then uh, uh, Stanton left after uh, President Johnson uh, fired him again. <laughs> so um, let me just add a footnote to that. Stanton really was. He really was a radical, very radical. Um, after the assassination of Lincoln, uh, what was the fellow's name? Uh, the, the actor Wilt 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 jumped on the stage and broke his uh, leg or arm, uh, ankle. He was. He and some others were staying at a boarding house there in Washington D.C. And Stanton was so, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, uh, he was wanting to, he was wanting to prosecute anybody and everybody who had anything to do with it. And the lady that ran the, the boarding house became the object of his ire. And he sent the authorities after her and she was charged and convicted and hanged. Oh my goodness. Yes. And and she maintained to the end that all I'm doing is running a, a boarding house. And she felt she you know, maintained her innocence all along. And uh, I suspect her I suspect she was. But Stanton was one of these radicals that anybody and everybody kind of like that had anything to do yeah. with that assassination was guilty. <laughs> and they were going to prosecute it. Guilt by association. Add, Bob? Uh, the only, with respect to that, uh, the statute that uh, uh, Doug was referring to uh, was later repealed, uh, and which is why, like at the present day, uh, 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 the president takes the takes the position that he has the right to fire anybody because uh, the ten, that statute was called the Tenure of Office Act, and it was subsequently repealed by Congress. And so, uh, it's the presumption then that the president can fire anybody uh, that he appoints. Okay. Now the other one is Harry Truman. No, no, I have Grover Cleveland before okay. that. Grover uh, Cleveland. Okay. And uh, Grover Cleveland. Uh, and under the, the, the Tenure of Office Act still existed under Grover Cleveland. And uh, they were still trying to, the Congress was still trying to rein in the president and uh, the executive branch. And uh, uh, Grover Cleveland, of course, didn't like that. And he had decided he was going to fire 600 of his appointees. And they uh, said, no, you can't do that under this act. 
and he basically said, yes, I'm going to do it, and I just, uh, uh, you can impeach me if you want to. <laughs> but they were going to impeach him over, the, over what they considered getting into their territory, you know, uh, their, their authority uh, as a legislative branch. And so uh, he just called their bluff, and that never got to impeachment. That was just more of a discussion of impeachment. And um, uh, eventually, as, as Bob said, uh, Congress just gave up, and then a few years after that, they uh, repealed that, that crazy uh, Tenure of Office Act. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you want to stay on chronology? Because if, well, you, do, you, uh, if you want to stay chronologically, then somebody else has the next president. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you have the next president? I, I don't have any. Pre I wasn't assigned any presidents. Okay. Uh, the only thing. All I the can rest of except. Uh, Harry Truman is yours, Fred. <laughs> well, uh, go ahead, Bob. Well, you, you have some. Right. Uh, just the, the one, give them the one that I the one that I have some knowledge about uh, is the impeachment of Nixon. Uh, uh, he uh, the basic charge against uh, Nixon uh, was that he used the CIA and the FBI uh, to. Uh, uh, cover up uh, the Watergate uh, burglary break-in. Um, once they got the tapes and everything, that was pretty clear. And uh, uh, so Nixon was due to articles uh, were due to be voted on by the House committee, uh, and uh, that's when Goldwater went in to uh, Nixon, as I understand it, and basically said, "You've lost all your support." And so he resigned. So the articles were never issued. Uh, he resigned in anticipation of that probably happening. So he might have been the only one that actually would have been impeached if he hadn't resigned. Yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, I, I understand there was a very famous quote. Goldwater said to him, you don't have the votes in the Senate. And specifically, do, you don't have mine. Wow. <laughs> and, when they got that personal, Nixon thought the jig is up. Go ahead. Oh, no, that, uh, I was um, just going to say, um, a while ago I was trying to think of the words articles of impeachment and I couldn't think of it. Well, Bob just said it. It's, it's the, that's what I was trying to tell you. that they, it's, well, I was calling it a petition, which it is, uh, but it's called articles of impeachment. Yeah. Okay. Let me just go on to Truman. Go, go ahead, yes. Truman, Truman, uh, yeah. talking about Truman. Okay, well, they tried to they tried to throw Harry Truman out. You you wouldn't believe that, but uh, when you hear the circumstances, you'll understand. Oh yeah, that's right. That's what I meant. <laughs> well, you know, I used to get this mixed up in my head, but in 1946 there was a, a, a railroad strike, and uh, President Truman was going to. Uh, uh, he was going to draft all the railroad workers, I think, or something. Well, what happened was it, it bled over into 1950 when we had the Korean War. Well, yeah, I, I was just, well, by that time we were talking about the steel industry yeah. instead of railroads. Yeah, so, that's what uh, I think he was concerned about. Yes, so anyway, during the Korean War, um, the steel mills were going to, going to go on strike. And of course, President Truman was uh, very pro-union, uh, but the the um, steel companies were very unreasonable. Uh, you know, they were making big profits, and they didn't want to give a, a small raise to to the union workers. Um, and so, during the Korean War, when it was really important to have steel, uh, it looked like this strike was it was going to happen. It had been brewing for quite a while, and so uh, President Truman, uh, he under the Taft-Hartley Taft Act, he could uh, invoke that and it would enjoin the, the uh, strike for 80 days while they negotiated. Well, he didn't want to do that because there had already been some negotiations and, and uh, there's a long story about different boards that they tried to use to negotiate. Uh, and he, was, he thought that it, it wasn't fair to the unions to continue uh, w with this delay and so he didn't want to invoke the Taft-Hartley Act. So uh, it got to the point where they were really negotiating very close to, um, to settlement. And uh, then the um, 
uh, the the uh, big steel mills decided they 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 didn't want to settle after all. So that really presented a crisis, and um, uh, you know how how um, uh, Trump wants to talk about national, you know, like a national emergency. Uh, well. President Truman really had a national emergency. I mean, we're in, at war, a major war, uh, and we needed we needed the steel. Where uh, we were talking about a, a silly fictional uh, wall, you know, uh, this was this was a real a real problem. And so, um, anyway, he he went ahead and did uh, issue an executive order uh, uh, for the government to actually take over the steel mills. Uh, and then, of course, the steel mills immediately went to court, made its way to the United States Supreme Court, and by, by a vote of six to three, they said that was unconstitutional. That seizure, Truman's seizure, was unconstitutional. Um, so Congress could have stepped in, Congress could have helped, but Congress didn't do what it, what it should have done. Um, and in the meantime, uh, there was a lot of talk about impeaching uh, President Truman because the, he, they had, he had overstepped his bounds is what, you know, basically what, what they were arguing, uh, which wasn't true at all. It was a really valid argument about whether or not he could do that. Uh, but the Supreme Court decided six to three that, that it was unconstitutional. Well, then the strike did occur. It lasted for uh, seven weeks after that. Uh, one third of the um, uh, steel that was needed for the war we had one third less than we needed for the war, I guess is the way to put it. And so it really was an, an important uh, thing that happened. And I think President Truman was, was uh, doing what he thought was best, even though that the court decided that, um, uh, you know, it was, it was unconstitutional. Um, and let's see, I guess, it, so it never got very far. I mean, it, just, it was just talk. You know, they were all mad that he did it. And so it was just talk about uh, impeachment. But that's... Uh, the important thing out of all this, though, is that um, the Supreme Court case is uh, Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, and Sawyer was the Secretary of Commerce, who was the one that the President Truman had, uh, you know, instructed to seize the mills, and so that's why it, it, the style of the case is, is reads like that, and so it's it's a very important test of presidential power. Um, and so if we compare it to today's situation, uh, you got to think that if President Truman didn't have the power to do that, when it was really, really an emergency and really, really critical, uh, then certainly Trump doesn't have the power to do the things that he wants to do. Makes me feel better, but he's doing it. So right, right. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. But he's doing it and getting away with it. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the case, unless it's challenged. Uh, there's no uh, contest. I uh, want you to remember before we get through, but uh, we'll go to Bob next, but I just want you to be sure to remember that only two of those 10 that we have listed on your handout ever got in the Senate. And that was number two, Andrew Johnson, and number nine, William Clinton. Yes, sir, you have a question? Yes, in the House, the vote to impeach is by a simple majority. Is that simple correct? majority, yes, sir. And in the Senate, it's the supermajority, right. two thirds. And that probably is the biggest reason that uh, we haven't had any convictions at all. Bob, would you want to uh, take one or two of these? And, uh, and I'm the only one that I uh, uh, I know anything about is uh, Mr. Clinton. Uh, um, and we, that's all within our memories, uh, everyone here. Uh, basically, Ken Starr, who was uh, one, a, uh, I think he was un appointed under the Independent Counsel Act, yeah. which they had at the time, uh, basically recommended that Congress uh, uh, consider uh, uh, evidence that Clinton had obstructed justice, tampered with witnesses, lied to a grand jury, and uh, uh, concealed evidence in that uh, Paula Jones case. And that was all after the Peccadillo's. Yes. It wasn't the acts themselves. It was what happened afterwards. Yeah. I'm sorry for the Yeah. Answer. 
And uh, so anyway, uh, 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 the Republican House representatives uh, voted in early 99 to impeach him based on uh, Ken Starr's referral. Uh, I find it ironic that uh, Ken Starr ended up being uh, at Baylor and essentially involved in the same thing, only uh, it was the Baylor football team that was, uh, yeah, that was engaging in all the sexual misconduct. And he, was having to <laughs> he, was, he was covering it up as the president oh, of Baylor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was, that was an ironic thing to me. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, uh, in any event, uh, uh, the House of Representatives, which was a Republican at the time, uh, uh, voted to impeach. And uh, basically the argument was that uh, uh, Clinton had failed his sworn duty to make sure that the laws were faithfully executed. Uh, the case was tried in the Senate. Um, uh, Lindsey Graham was one of the House managers, uh, so essentially he was the uh, one of the prosecutors for the House of Representatives when it was tried in the Senate, and uh, uh, Clinton was acquitted. Uh, I remember what, listening to the closing argument uh, from his side. It was a senator from Arkansas who, uh, uh, I can't remember which senator it was, uh, but basically, and he, huh? I think it was, my, my, might have been Dale, yes, uh, who basically got up, if you recall, and basically said, you know, lying about sex, that's what people do. <laughs> so we're going to impeach the president for lying about sex. And uh, uh, so Clinton was acquitted. It took two thirds uh, to convict him, and uh, uh, they only had uh, 50 votes uh, for conviction. So. Uh, and then I think you all know the rest of the story. Uh, it ended up, their failed impeachment uh, ended up making Clinton more popular than ever. Yeah, that, that was an interesting outcome of it. Clinton's popularity rose after the impeachment. And uh, it, it is, I, I think it's not hard to observe that both prosecutions in the Senate have uh, occurred by the same party. Uh, they've been very vindictive, uh, and uh, <coughs> to go, to uh, prosecute the president over uh, Peccadillo's uh, was, I, I think, a little short-sighted. And, and poor Nixon, Nixon was trying to cover it up. That's what got him in trouble. It wasn't the act itself of burglary; it was covering it up. And. Uh, that was his downfall. Uh, anything else, Bob? Uh, not on these particular people. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you want us to hand out these other sheets you've got? We only have one sheet. You want us to yeah, hand no, out no. the other That's one? That's all I have, one sheet. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. this is for you and me, Debbie. Oh. Those others were just to inform you, and so okay. you can, if, if things become a law, you could ask a question. <laughs> There'd be a question. Yeah, I've got one. Yes, um, go so, ahead. So the Senate essentially isn't deciding whether the charges They're not the are initiative. true or not. It, it's just whether they want to do anything with them. That's right. So in Clinton's case, did, did they even, you know, did they, did they even state that? Did they say, yeah, oh, yeah, he obstructed justice, but we're not going to convict him anyway? They, they don't make findings of fact. They just vote to impeach or not. Right. So, they're, so they're given the case, and they're just and, and, and so what their answer is is it particularly based on the case? Then? Right. Exactly. Is it presented to the Senate? I mean, does somebody mm -hmm. the managers from the House? Yeah, the room, managers. Do they present it? I yeah, mean, they present the evidence. Okay. And the information, and, the and then the Senate has to vote. Do we believe that or not? But, but they essentially are not finding him. In other words, they didn't find him not guilty. No, no. They just said we're not going to. We're not. Gonna, we're not that's gonna, that's we're the way with the criminal him. case. You remember O.J. Simpson yeah. and his trial. Yeah. Right. It's he like was a, it's not a civil found case. Guilty. Right. I see. And yeah. when you find yeah. the person, when you count 
you don't find them guilty, that doesn't mean you find them innocent. Right. That's exactly what Mr. Mueller yes. is saying yes. in his report. Right. Yes. And that's why the House wants him to testify and to emphasize that, that he's not saying he's innocent. He's just saying, I can't prove it and I can't, I can't uh, right. suggest. Can't do anything about it. Uh, well, yes, and that's another question on that handout. Can you, is the president above the law? And the answer is no, he's not above the law. Because there's another provision that I didn't, I tried to keep this to one page. And there's one more provision in the Constitution that says uh, after the, the impeachment simply removes him from office and disqualifies him from holding any further federal office. And then the, it goes on to say that he's subject to being indicted uh, uh, the, uh, and charged and fined and imprisoned or whatever. So it's pretty clear in the Constitution that once he leaves office, he's then subject to, uh, to uh, charge, uh, subject to prosecution. Now the question is, will the statute of limitations run? And uh, I have two lawyers here, and they would love to argue that issue. <laughs> Uh, and I'll, I'll just throw out my thought. The general view of the law is that if someone places himself in a position so that he can't be brought to justice, you know, he runs out of the jurisdiction or something of that nature, uh, what happens is the law views that as a toll, that is a, a cessation of time. In other words, while they're out, the clock doesn't run. So and then were, when they come so back So if you were in, to go to a country that yeah. didn't allow extradition, then yeah. that's essentially what the presidency is. Then. So I right. think the time that he spends in office is not going to count against the statute of limitations. Now, I don't know what you guys think sure. about that. You think that's a, a fair approach that the law will take? I would think that that would be a matter of statute I think most statute of limitations tollings, at least under Missouri law, are statutory. I don't think there's a common law tolling. And so uh, unless the uh, statute of limitations tolling provision uh, says that you can't convict somebody while he's president, I mean charge him while he's president, then I wouldn't think that your suggestion would be well taken. <laughs> That if you're relying on the common law, that's fine. But if there's a statute on it, that will take precedence over what generally would be the common law. But there's not a statute. What? But there's not one. I, I, I wouldn't know. think I that there would be a tolling statute on uh, on Probably on that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, every bad thing he d has done that's a crime has a statute connected to it. That's. Right. <laughs> And so it's, they're all going to have statutes of limitations on them. Um, but and when does the statute, I mean, okay, if he's not been charged yet, doesn't, or does it, it goes back to when he did it, like in July no. of 16 the, or whenever? The, the, I, don't th I really don't think there's going to be a, if, if you're looking at the, uh, uh, the Trump situation, okay, if he obstructed justice in 2017, uh, I would predict uh, that that is a continuing obstruction uh, going on yet today. And so I don't think uh, that uh, it's going to be a six uh, statutes of limitations are, uh, yeah, there, it's you're just, you know, they're going to come up with some tag that's going to show that in uh, 2020, uh, he did this act in furtherest, furtherance of his prior obstruction. You know, I just don't foresee the statute being an issue. No, you have any comments? Oh, I, I agree with what Bob just said. Yeah. I, I like that argument. All this is going to be argued. I mean, you know, yeah. everything we've said is going to be argued. I'd rather be court. representing the prosecution on that side of the issue. <laughs> Now, Bob used to be a prosecutor. I used to be a criminal defense lawyer. <laughs> We've actually tried cases against each other. 
<laughs> were you a prosecutor at one time? Yeah, 79 to 81. Oh, you were. Okay. And yeah. Doug was a defense lawyer yeah. at that then, time, so yeah. we've got a good mix. The case we tried, he was uh, appointed to represent a uh, gentleman who was charged with rape. And uh, it was one of those, uh, somebody came into the room while they were engaged in the act. And uh, since uh, he was a, she, since uh, the fellow that she was with was of a different uh, race, uh, all of a sudden the consensual act was rape. That would have been 1981 or 80. My, my, client, my client was found not guilty. Yeah. And um, it was a huge African-American gentleman and a little teeny white girl. And I had an all-white jury. Uh, but uh, I won that case. I was a big whiff. Let me say that in the House, they do the charging. In the Senate, they do the convicting. And they do the impeachment. It's, it's really kind of that simple. Yes, sir. So I'm thinking with the criminal convictions or criminal charges after the, he leaves office, in the case of Richard Nixon, uh, he was pardoned. Yeah, and, and so they, they couldn't bring anything Nobody went him. after him. But the question would be with Donald Trump, if he finishes his term and then leaves office, there's nobody to pardon him possibly unless he pardons himself. And that's one of the questions you know, no, whether he or not he could do I don't that. think there's any way he could pardon himself. Okay. But the more likely scenario would be that uh, after he loses uh, the election, uh, then uh, he would resign, uh, and then uh, Pence, would have some. during the last, during January right. of 2021, or whatever it is, uh, would pardon him while, during that sliver of time that, that Pence would be president. And that'll probably be a deal. That's pro that's my s scenario for unless what's going to happen. Unless he's to the point where he's like not going to leave, lock himself in, and not going to leave. Yeah, yeah. That's when New York will go after him. Yeah. Because they can't pardon him for state offenses. Right. Yeah. Could, yes, and, and that could happen. But then once a person is out of the office, You've got a new person in the American public sometimes, and, and Congress sometimes becomes very forgiving. I don't think the public's going to forgive Trump. Not, not the people who, are, who really are against Trump. I don't think they will be forgiven. His supporters will be upset and they'll, they'll be support him no matter what he does. But those of us that are just really disgusted and, and mortified by him will never forgive him. Well, I, I think that's probably that. so. But I doubt they can get Congress to be that interested in it, in doing anything about it. Or even the uh, prosecuting authorities in New York or wherever it is. But that's, we'll have to wait and see about that. All right, any other, any other questions? Or? We were talking a while ago about, about uh, the trial itself, and there actually is a trial. Uh, with witnesses, and uh, and then the chief justice actually is the presiding judge, um, and you know because it's a political act, you, you would think that they would have to stay within the confines of the uh, articles of impeachment, like lawyers have to stay in the confines of their pleadings, and you've probably heard the objection irrelevant. Well, you know if you start talking about something that's got nothing to do with what you pled in your pleadings, it's you can't bring it in, and so it's irrelevant. But in this, because it's a political situation rather than a, a courtroom trial, uh, they do go outside. In fact, in the Andrew Johnson case, they were bringing in everything that they could think of and, and that had nothing to do with the, with the articles of impeachment themselves. Mm. Uh, so they didn't follow uh, what you would in the, in the courtroom in that, in that particular case. Uh, but there is, there is a trial with witnesses. Yes, sir, go ahead. You know, it's kind of interesting to me because you keep coming back to this, the difference between a legal case and an impeachment, which is a political case. Yes. And just like you were talking about during Clinton's impeachment and the closing arguments, where you would, it wouldn't make any difference in a legal case, but in the closing arguments, they said, well, maybe he did this, but everybody does. Mm -hmm. 
and that was a defense in in this political arena. So, well, was, and, and it wasn't serious enough to warrant, right? I mean, that was the bottom line. It wasn't just that everybody does but, it. But if if that would have been a legal situation, oh yeah, yeah. If they were, were if, if they were trying for. Right. Trying him for perjury, he okay. yeah, it, seems like, it seems like the way I'm understanding it is the conviction is really just do we want to throw him out or not. It has nothing to do with anything else. That's right. I think that's pretty I mean, much true. Yeah. Any other questions? We're almost out of time, and I want to get you home so you can hear the debate in, uh, where is it, Miami? In Miami. Uh, yes. And so it's time for that. Uh, we appreciate you coming. We appreciate and, uh, you. That was so we're happy. Oh, I, I, I did have, I, I did have one other thing, uh, just a, a prediction. Okay, I predict uh, that as one of its last acts, uh, the current House of Representatives uh, will impeach uh, Trump, but they'll do like uh, Mitch McConnell did uh, when Merrick Garland. Uh, was up, uh, they'll just say, we're, we're, we're going to impeach him and we're going to let the people decide in November uh, of 2020 uh, whether to convict him. I think that is probably uh, correct. I think that's probably about what will happen. And you'll notice the stage is already set. Uh, they have Mr. Mueller coming to testify before the two uh, houses uh, two uh, committees in the House. Uh, and what they're going to do is slowly bring out the evidence and the information for you leading up to November of 2000, uh, 2020. And that's exactly what they want to do is let the American people know exactly what has been going on rather than them trying to throw the president out of the office they want the American people to do so. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's that's our next program. We put on the second program, and it's called Executive Privilege. And that's where, when they ask for this information from the president's office, they say, oh, we can't give you that. It's covered by executive privilege. And so we might just give you a little inkling into that idea. You see, there are certain privileged communications in the law. One of them is the communication between a husband and wife, between a lawyer and a client, a doctor and a patient the, the uh, minister and the penitent. Well, there is, has also been created in the U.S. versus Nixon case. You gave that, didn't you, Bob? Yeah. In the Nixon case, they, they talked about that. It's called an executive privilege. That is, it's covered by three areas, which is diplomacy, the military, and national security, and if it cover if it's if it's within those three areas, then it's covered. Uh, it covers by it's it's withheld under the uh, executive privilege rule. But if it's outside that, it shouldn't be covered. So that's just an ink, uh, I, uh, a little inkling into that program, and we do that one also if you have time. Uh, if not, that's we understand. Thank you. We would. I'm going to take that one. In. <laughs> yep. There you go. Um, thanks to our panelists, Doug, uh, Fred, Bob. Thank you so much for shedding some light on the impeachment process and the historical perspective. Because for those who are clamoring you know, for impeachment. When you look at it, the fact that there were 10 that faced it, only two that actually went to the Senate and zero convictions, then 
it really is um, one of those things that you have to put it all in perspective to understand exactly what the house is doing at this point in time in, in their uh, proceedings. Sure, sure. So anyway, again, panelists, thank you for being here. Thank the rest of you for being here this evening on a night. Going to get you out in time to get home to listen to the debates. Uh, just a reminder, the fourth Wednesday of every month right here at the Library Center, um, 6.30 to 7.30, we will be discussing different issues. So we'd love to see you back. Thank you.